Thank you very much, Prof Chetty. Oh my word. Um, we've got a few questions, but it was it was so marvelous sitting and listening to you. It was so eloquent and it was almost poetic. So we have a few questions, Prof Chetty. The one is from Prof Youngerball. And he was asking the question in the South African context, South Africa spends millions on social upliftment, social grants, free education, free healthcare, et cetera. And for the most in need, these are for the most in need, but yet there seems to be no significant dent on improving the lives of the poor. Where and why are we getting this wrong? Would you like another question or would you like to respond to that one first? Um, thanks, Anita. Um, I, I addressed that question a bit, but I would I would go back to it. It's is that, yes, uh, the current state has increased uh, the funding, you know, um, for social issues and uh, towards the poor, like the grants, etc. But what the what the state has not done is address the poverty traps. The poverty traps are very strong. And unless you address the poverty traps, especially in the socioeconomic situation of disadvantaged communities, uh, we're gonna find further pauperization. So no matter how much the state puts in, you know, to collaborate this further pauperization. So people still say that, you know, uh, poverty has deepened. So. So it's, it's unless you address the uh, poverty traps, and what are the poverty traps? The poverty traps is unemployment, uh, institutional inequalities in terms of you know, power and property. And we saw how um, you know, in the Western Cape, there's been so many evictions of people. So you know, on the one hand, uh, states talks about providing housing. On the other hand, the housing injustice towards poor people is, is just increasing so much. So you have such a great divide between the elite and the poorest half of the population, which is a second trap. And how do you like, you know, kind of that, uh, how do you address that Gini coefficient? And, and, and then the chronic community poverty, you know, kind of, we're not addressing this in a, in a more rigorous manner. And lastly, it's, it's the dynamics of society, especially in terms of violence and of health. And uh, unless we address that, we're still going to be stuck within the poverty traps. And I think that uh, what we need to do, engage more deeply, especially the social scientists and, and the state, is how to address the poverty traps. Because we found that the poverty traps have, have really not been addressed in a, a systematically and a coherent manner uh, by the state. Thanks, Prof Chetty. Then we have another question. How, as academic researchers, do we, communi do we communicate to the community about research findings beyond reporting on research and peer-reviewed publications in journals? Yeah, uh, I think that's very obvious because it, you know, it, it just shows that there's no mutual benefits because much of our work is published in international journals because that is, you know, puts us in a higher ranking within the university. And even the local journals as well, the South African journals, you know, uh, communities don't have access to it. And especially we in education, we, you know, we get so much of uh, research collateral from communities, but we don't uh, share uh, those findings and it also doesn't make a social impact, you know. We constantly go out and collect the data and then we publish it. So I'm saying that that has to be disrupted. There has to be a mutual benefit of research. And in fact, we should not only research on communities, and I think that's a problem why we have such a low social impact, but rather we should have communities, you know, as co-producers of that knowledge. For example, um, you know, if you look at teacher education in my faculty, we train teachers um, for the idealized classroom. And yet many of our students come from disadvantaged contexts. How about you know, giving those students voice and letting those students explain to us what it means to be 12 years 
in, you know, in such disadvantaged, under-resourced schools and how that voice can actually change how we train our teachers because then we also train teachers for the disadvantaged classroom. Thanks, Prof. Chetty, that was well done. And then we, are there any other questions that people want to raise without putting it in the chat if you want to raise your hand? You're more than welcome to do that. Prof. Levac? No, maybe just a comment around the promotions. Uh, Prof. Chetty, I take your point that um, our current criteria does speak to community engagement. And as you know, with the promotions, we, we look at how the academic has integrated the community engagement with learning and teaching and research. But I do think since we're focusing so much on the social impact and hopefully taking that further into the um, uh, a draft institutional um, framework on, on, on uh, the scholarship of engagement, that we have the opportunity to tweak that question, that area slightly to also incorporate um, social impact. I do see for us the opportunity, especially from you were talking about rankings, when we look at the impact rankings, um, uh, there's a good argument uh, to, be, to be made that, um, you know, the, the mere fact that you're doing a different kind of research uh, and if you can show societal impact, there's a way in which that data can be made available that will benefit the university. And that's conversation that we need to have as a university, but also benefit the, the, the community that's co-creators of, of the knowledge that was being created. And I mean, I work um, very much in the community and, it, and it's actually not so difficult to give feedback to the community. You, you have your sessions uh, with the community and, and you ensure that you don't speak down to people, that you're not patronizing in your feedback, and that you acknowledge the contribution of the of the community in that, whether it's research or whether it is, for example, a curriculum that's been um, developed um, through engagement also with communities. And that's actually a very, very um, exciting part of our curriculum transformation renewal to have other voices incorporated in that. But I'll we'll probably come to, to that um, later when, when I speak. So yes, thank you for that. Um, I think we've once we've analyzed the, the next three days, um, hopefully with your input now uh, during, um, as our keynote speaker, we would be in a position that's high on our list of priorities for next year to be developing that framework that will link them to also to our curriculum transformation and, and um, renewal framework that's on its way that will be um, in front of our Senate uh, on the 3rd of November. So thank you for that input. Thank you, Prof. Prof. Lavak, is there anybody else who has a question? Prof. Lavak, is your hand up again or is it an old end? It's a oh, previous one. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then we had a question, so are academics supposed to share their research funds? they get for publications. Oh, their research funds. I'm sorry, Jacob, I thought their research findings they get with communities they took them from. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm withdrawing my comment, Jacob. I thought you meant their research findings. The research funds, um, anybody would like to answer that? Uh, I think that uh, you can use your research funds to um, enrich your research into your community and also like, you know, uh, kind of look at ways that the, uh, um, that, that is not uh, uh, kind of funded usually. For example, um, you know, in, in, in terms of say, uh, the kind of work that we need to do with, uh, say with youth violence, you know, how we kind of go out and, and, and collect narratives and youth stories, et cetera. And, uh, so you can use your research funds for that kind of research, uh, community-based research. Sorry, thanks, Prof. Chetty. I'm just getting to the people. Cornell Hart, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Program Director. I think mine is also just 
Um, first and foremost, Prof. Chetu, thanks very much. Um, I think so many of the points that you've raised, um, sharing different case studies, is going to link so well with the program for today, tomorrow, and Thursday. I just want to comment briefly on a um, point made by Jacob. I think first and foremost, and this will come up during this week with the program as to um, who is community, because we tend to refer to community only as civil society. And so there's more about that um, over these three days. And then I want to share an example of a project where I'm part of with colleagues of mine, an NRF project um, at the School of Pharmacy, where we ensure that um, not only does the money from publications, which um, authors cannot withdraw cash from an author's fund, um, you can put it to good use, so to speak, just like some of us has done it last year to donate to the community of students with no student to be left um, out or behind. And then we've also in our in our F group, what we do is we publish with our partners in the communities um, so that we do not become the pen to author, but that they co-author with us. And because of that, this is always a challenge then for publication fees, et cetera. And so that's our best way to contribute back, not just to acknowledge that indigenous knowledge and the people who has done so, but in in the same process, also making Authors Fund available for the publication fee or the page fee, especially in some of the science journals. It's very, it's quite pricey um, because we also would like to publish in open access journals, which is again, the academic scholarship community where we want to ensure that knowledge is available to everybody. And at the same time, we've also contributed with some of our community partners. Um, we make them attend conferences with us, present with us. And so that fee is every time absorbed from our author's funds. Thank you, Program Director. Thanks, Dr. Hart. Um, Dr. Pluto? Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Martin and, and Prof for the response. Paul, thank you also, Cornell, for responding. Um, I'm, I'm just uh, want to join the conversation with Prof Chetty and, and thank you very much for um, the wonderful um, presentation that you give. Uh, and I agree with you, there is a number of poverty traps. And the moment you started speaking about poverty traps and the systemic issue that, that, that people are facing, especially communities from which we are taking our research and publish it, um, it came to mind to me is that um, academics get um, authors funds. Uh, so there's funds that's coming in because of those publications. But if we, for example, uh, take the Busman community in, in the Kalahari, for many years, um, researchers have, have went there and take knowledge from them uh, which they wouldn't have uh, gotten uh, in any other way, but then the funds uh, is this, uh, the, the, the disposal of the funds is solely that of, of the researcher. But the researcher clearly is not in that sense, the true expert on the plant or the indigenous knowledge that they are publishing, but yet the money is going to them. So I'm just thinking that might be another poverty trap and it's something that then points to a type of ethics that we have to consider and, 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 and think about in the university is um, how would how do we get communities out of this particular po poverty trap if we're going to reorientate ourselves as the university? I think, I think the way universities are structured as well is that, you know, it's the, the neoliberal and marketization of universities um, they for example you know you would have a deputy dean of teaching and learning you'll have a deputy dean of research but like you know community engagement is something that uh, people will do that feel like doing it so you know um, the, the kind of separation from society and the ivory tower is, is, is something that has uh, kind of got stronger and also how the voice of the academic during 
uh, apartheid, you know, if you think of the Rick Turners and the Neville Alexanders, et cetera, and what we have now with, with the worse uh, situation in terms of uh, kind of social ills and uh, not so much worse, but similar. Um, but how the voice has been silenced and, uh, you know, and how uh, communities are not seen as integral to our work. And especially in the case studies also, we saw how um, academics uh, get, get so uh, involved in, the, in their research, especially from a scientific perspective, that this seems to be total isolation uh, of people and uh, community. Thanks, Prof. Chetty. And then we've got a last question from Prof. Youngerbal. Uh, thank you. Mine is more comment. Uh, and it deals with the, with the ethics of community engagement. And uh, I think, from my experience in dentistry, I mean, we always. Uh, Sorry, Prof. Youngerpol, your voice is going away at times. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. So, having. Uh, I mean, I'm using the context of dentistry as a point of entry into communities. We've often found that, uh, you know, it's, it's almost unethical to go out there and screen and look for cases and conditions that are related to our area of interest. Because when you screen, you create this uh, expectation of treatment and it's almost unethical to, to sort of do that, but don't provide the backup treatment that is necessary. So I think the ethics of uh, research, uh, I'm not sure if covered in the next few days, but the, the ethical responsibilities for researchers in terms of the community engagement is a, is a, is a huge problem in many settings. And uh, yeah, I think that's very, very important that, I mean, I would go as far as to say that if, in developing a research protocol, there should be a section there where you you have a, a, a sort of a, a paragraph or two on how you can do, how the community is going to benefit and what actions you're going to take in terms of making sure that the community is also um, in this win-win situation that we call research. Thank you. Thanks, Prof. Youngerpol. I didn't hear a whole lot of that, so it could be my connection. Um, Prof. Chetty, were you able to hear the question? <laughs> no, Anita, but I thought it was more uh, comment and support of the ethics. Okay. okay. Thank you. Is there one last question? Because I know we are one question away from virtual tea time. None? Connell, is that an old hand? Old hand? <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. Is it, it an old hand? It's okay. staying on the floor, but it's a very old hand. <laughs> No, I just saw your hand was still raised, or is it raised again? No, no, I'll bring it down. Thank you. So without any further, if there are no further questions, I'd like to say from our side, Prof Chetty, thank you so much. It was, it was such an enlightening and such a reminder. And when we hear you speak so poetically about the voice and the voices and then the voiceless. And we realize the importance of authentic and ethical community engagement and the role of academia. And I love the section about moving it from the margins, from the periphery to the center, because it is about the agency and making sure that we have authentic partnerships with the communities that we engage. So thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.